Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, we're in for a great presentation from Alex Rodriguez. Um, he's a writer, improviser, trombonist, and PhD candidate in the Department of Ethnomusicology here at UCLA. He recently served as Editor-in-Chief for Ethnomusicology Review, and his work has been published by Jazz Perspectives, NPR Music, LA Weekly, and um, WBGO, and the Newark Star Ledger. His current research focuses on jazz clubs around the world and the creative uh, improvised music communities that sustain them with case studies in California, Chile, and Siberia. Welcome him. So thank you so much for the invitation and uh, for the opportunity to present some of some of this work and in particular to reflect on this through the lens of black studies, which is something that um, as I'm starting to write my dissertation this year is becoming more and more of a critical frame to, to think about all, all of this work. Um, and so today I'm gonna the, have sort of two parts to this this presentation. The first part is going to be a paper that I'm going to read the text that I've prepared and I have some accompanying slides. And then I'm going to, in a little bit more of an informal way, share some, some stories around some of the folks that I've been working with in this research. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, and also, uh, to have a sense of the frame here, uh, I, I recently presented this paper that I'm about to give at the uh, British Forum for Ethnomusicology Conference in Sheffield in the United Kingdom. And so part of the frame that I'd like to think together around all of this work is uh, also the way that, to, I'm going to reflect a little bit on how the talk was received in the UK and uh, some, some of the additional questions that that brought up for me. So uh, for starters, I'm just going to read this, this part and uh, look at the slides here. So in the preface to the second edition of his seminal ethnography, Sound and Sentiment, Steve Feld writes, quote, an, an ethnography is a report of a unique experience. It is about the dialogue of sensibilities implicated in encountering a people and place. The work and the writer are then specifically accountable, not just to the interpretive preoccupations of scholarly readers, but to that people and place and to the need for incisive honesty in their depiction. That depiction situates ethnography as an account of a specific yet indefinite encounter, something that is at once empirically brutal and interpretively subtle. This dynamic creates numerous ironic mysteries for an author, and no less for the people who are trying to figure out what the author is up to. But in the end, an ethnographer's accountability for depiction is more than an accountability for representation. It is an accountability to other human beings whose lives, desires, and sensitivities are no less complicated than his or her own. Since advancing to doctoral candidacy in May 2015, I have been conducting ethnographic fieldwork in jazz clubs around the world. Certainly, this has been a unique experience. Um, my report of this unique experience, however, is complicated by the fact that it does not address any singular people or place. Uh, this work focuses on three clubs in Los Angeles, California, Santiago de Chile, and Novosibirsk, Siberia, separated by approximately 19,000 kilometers, almost half the Earth's circumference. And those are three dots on the map of the three places where I've been spending my time. Uh, a person who spends their time in one of these clubs likely speaks a different language than their counterparts at the others, and most likely is not even aware of the other's existence. Nonetheless, in this presentation, I intend to show that these three clubs share a sense of emplacement, uh, despite these obvious differences, in what I call jazz space. This space, anchored in places such as clubs, festivals, and educational institutions, affords ways of being in the world through sound that resonate across vast geographies and acoustomology of global scale. Riffing on Stephen Bell's formulation of ethnography cited earlier, which considers ethnography as the dialogue of sensibilities implicated in encountering a people and place, what follows is an initial report of this unique experience, the dialogue of sensibilities implicated in encountering people in jazz space particularly that which has taken over, 
taken place over the last five years of field work in California, Chile, and Siberia. In order to frame this report, I draw on the work of an eclectic group of thinkers that includes scholars in anthropology, ethnomusicology, sociology, and black studies, as well as jazz musicians themselves. So my understanding of the word people is inspired by this 1964 Duke Ellington interview in which the esteemed band leader discusses his suite, My People, composed for the Century of Negro Progress exhibition in Chicago the year before. Rather than take the interviewer's cue to talk about the African-American people, he answered the question coyly, addressing his membership in a variety of other groups. Quote, let's see, my people. Now, which of my people? I'm in several groups. I'm in the group of piano players. I'm in the group of listeners. I'm in the group of people who have general appreciation of music. I'm in the group of those who aspire to be dilettantes. I'm in the group of those who attempt to produce something fit for the plateau. I'm in the group of, <coughs> oh yeah, those who appreciate Beaujolais. And of course, I've had such a strong influence by the music of the people. The people, that's the better word. The people, rather than my people, because the people are my people. In my field of research at these three clubs, many of the people with whom I came into contact shared Ellington's group membership as listeners, music appreciators, aspirational dilettantes, and seekers of excellence. A handful were also pianists and wine aficionados. However, only a few shared his positionality as African American. And yet, it is precisely these people's shared celebration of black music that affords the conditions for black agency in these places, all of which exist on the geographical fringes of the black Atlantic. In his essay, Blackness and Nothingness, Mysticism in the Flesh, Fred Moten describes celebration as a crucial alternative to Afro-pessimist nihilism. Quote, our aim, even in the face of the brutally imposed conditions of black life, is cause for celebration. This is not because celebration is supposed to make us feel good or make us feel better, though there would certainly be nothing wrong with that. It is rather because the cause for celebration turns out to be the condition of possibility of black thought which animates the black operations that will produce the absolute overturning, the absolute turning of this motherfucker out. Celebration is the essence of black thought, the animation of black operations, which are, in the first instance, our undercommon, underground, submarine sociality. And I can't emphasize enough how deeply grateful I have been to be able to bear witness to this submarine sociality as it's practiced in various forms by people from Santiago to Siberia. My approach bears many resemblances to the Malinowskian ideal of anthropological participation in ob participant observation fieldwork. However, following Brian Moore and I would argue that this approach also resembles the inversion of that idea, observant participation. And I participate as a white North American who is also invested in the practice of listening in space, connected to other listeners through mutual engagement with the jazz world. I do so as a longtime jazz trombonist and writer, having also done so as a music critic, radio DJ, student, and teacher. Furthermore, I do so with a full awareness of the fact that our connectedness stems from the appeal of jazz as a universal signifier. Anna Singh encourages us to think of universals not as truths or lies, but as sticky engagements, and posits they are brought into being in the world through a process she calls friction the awkward, unequal, unstable, and creative qualities of interconnection across difference. This is certainly true of jazz practice as well. Light Singh's fieldwork process for her 2005 book, Friction, and Ethnography of Global Connection, this fieldwork prepares the ground for another ethnography of global connection, with black radical aesthetics as a key ingredient for maintaining and reproducing these connections. This is also deeply inspired by the internationalist emphasis in Robin Kelly's work, for example, his book, Africa Speaks, American Answer, America Answers, which focuses on the transatlantic pathways of four jazz musicians between Africa and the USA. Thinking about jazz as a trace of blackness in global circulation, one with emancipatory potential for humanity as a whole, allows for a deeper acknowledgement of the importance and power of black cultural practices in this especially challenging historical moment. It also resonates with the intentions of many jazz musicians themselves, such as Louis Armstrong, John Coltrane, and Ornette Coleman, who considered their artistic goals to be rooted in their own experiences of injustice as African Americans, while also articulating a broader 
universal aspiration towards human liberation on a planetary scale. So I'd like to circle back for a moment and return to my initial riff on Stephen Feld's definition. Ethnography is about the dialogue of sensibilities implicated in encountering people in jazz space. Now that we have a sense of what I mean by people, I'd like to dig into the second half of that formulation, jazz space. The space that is animated by the black operation of jazz performance. Musicians have long understood the diffuse sense of emplacement that this form of activity necessitates. For example, in his autobiography, Treated Gentle, early jazz pioneer Sidney Bechet offers a poetic metaphor for his understanding of jazz meaning. Quote, but that's what the music is, a lost thing finding itself. It's like a man with no place of his own. He wanders the world and he's a stranger wherever he is. He's a stranger right in the place where he was born. But then something happens to him and he finds a place, his place. He stands in front of it and he crosses the door, going inside. That's where the music was that day. It was taking him through the door. He was coming home. In my recent travels, I found that the doors to this home are numerous and dispersed widely across the planet. Bechet's metaphor also resonates deeply with my own struggle to find home in the space afforded by this music, as evidenced by my own jazz door moments, the first of which took place in August 2005. Although it happened nearly 12 years ago, I remember walking into the Club de Jazz de Santiago in Santiago, Chile with impeccable clarity. Living for the first time outside the United States to spend an undergraduate semester abroad there, I had learned quickly that nothing felt like home. Everything from crossing the street to ordering lunch was uncomfortable guesswork. As I entered into the club, crossing the door and going inside, to use Bechet's words, I was overcome by an uncanny sense of familiarity. Somehow, amidst these mundane but magical circumstances, I was home, 10,000 kilometers away from my birthplace in the Pacific Northwestern United States. At the same time, this was such an utter relief that I barely even bothered to wonder how my strong identification with the jazz world could resonate so powerfully in such a dizzyingly remote place. As this encounter grew into frequent collaborations, though, I came to understand that this paradox of geographical distance and musical intimacy, sparked by a mutual dedication to jazz improvisation, left an indelible mark on all of us. Five months later, I left with a hunch that I had merely scratched the surface of what was possible when like-minded musicians defied geography. As these Chilean improvisers and I had started to do that night at the Coupe de Jazz. The adventure into which I had stumbled during my semester abroad quickly took on a new set of meetings when I took ethnomusicologist Jeffers Engelhardt's seminar entitled Global Sound upon my return to the United States. This was my introduction to the field, and I recognized that what I had been endeavoring to do the previous year resonated with accounts of ethnomusicological fieldwork. Two years later, humbled by my struggles as a freelance jazz musician after college, I also felt a growing longing to return to Chile. Studying ethnomusicology, I thought, might be my ticket south. But a funny thing happened on the way to the airport. Shortly after arriving at, here in Los Angeles to start graduate school, uh, ostensibly to conduct ethnomusicological fieldwork with Chilean jazz musicians, I found another jazz door to cross through at the newly opened club, Blue Whale. I think, are you in this picture, Otto, yet? Yeah, Otto. <laughs> Rocking the bass back there. Uh, so, Blue Whale, if you haven't been there, highly recommend it. It's right, right, still, still going strong in downtown Los Angeles. And when I entered for the first time, I was struck by a similar sensation to that which I had felt at the Club de Jazz de Santiago. I soon came to understand that the sense of home that I experienced didn't only exist in Santiago or in Los Angeles, but in jazz space itself. This was a consoling realization, given that the physical space of the Club de Jazz at that point no longer existed. It had been destroyed by the massive earthquake that struck Chile in 2010. The site, and the site was redeveloped as a high-rise condominium complex. So I purchased a notebook and started attending events at Blue Whale as frequently as possible. I got to know the owner, June Lee, and the handful of musicians in his inner circle on whom he relied for booking advice. I now began to frame this time at Blue Whale as the first step in a multi-club ethnography of jazz space, which would take me to the Club Thelonious in Santiago in September 2015, and then to Truba in Novosibirsk, Siberia. 
wait, there's jazz in Siberia? Whenever I tell someone about my work, that is by far the most common response. I, I, I chose to close my fieldwork travels in Nova Sibirsk in part to address this issue and to see how far I could go to find jazz space, having heard about Truba from ethnomusicologist and violist Tani Kalmanovich. I had begun learning Russian at the time, in part to be able to speak with my wife Marina's Russian-American family, and could eke out just enough to introduce myself by, ego, by email to uh, eager Russian interlocutors with Marina's help. After a long, complicated, and occasionally improvised travel itinerary, we flew to Novosibirsk in October of last year for one month. Thankfully, another jazz door awaited us there at Truba, which had in fact closed and reopened in a new location since I had first heard about its existence three years earlier. So, do these three places really have anything in common? Uh, the most obvious trait is that they share that the most obvious trait that they share is that each uses the word jazz to identify itself. Uh, Blue Whale's website includes the tagline live jazz and art space. Thelonious is billed as Lugar de Jazz, a place of jazz. And as you can see uh, from, the, oh, this is from the previous slide, Truba's door is emblazoned with the words Jazz Club Truba in both Latin and Cyrillic alphabets. The three also gesture to the music's African-American masters in various ways. Uh, Thelonious is named after the piano great Thelonious Monk. Blue Whale had a wall-length chalk portrait of Miles Davis on one of his walls during much of my time there. And Truba has this wall display shown here that pairs the best bourbon on the left, that's Taylor, Jameson, Chieftains, with the best music on the right, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Benny Carter. And that was, that's the only place I've seen Benny Carter in the jazz canon. This is Really hip audience, I think. Um, and also note that these are, uh, these are written in English, not in, in Russian. Um, so and the, the club also, all three of the clubs at various points, kind of like the room we're in right now, has photographs of, uh, of great musicians, oftentimes local jazz, jazz musicians, um, on, on the walls. So drawing from these and other commonalities, my sense of jazz space is inspired by both Sun Ra, shown here, and Henri Lefebvre. Uh, for Sun Ra, space is the place, the site of Afrofuturist possibility beyond the banalities of earthly oppression. For Lefebvre, uh, space situated the political imperative to ground resistance in the everyday lives of city dwellers, the site of capitalist spatiality and reproduction. Crucially, both Sun Ra and Lefebvre understand space as produced. For Sun Ra, this is achieved by space travel technologies. Uh, Lefebvre's theory derives from his influential book, Production of Space. And in that book, um, Edward Soja has described the, his imagined spatiality as the interplay between three kinds of spatial production. This is what he calls Lefebvre's trialectics of spatiality. And so these are perceived space, or that which we can experience through our sense perceptions, conceived space, which is that our minds project onto realities, so, such as a design drawing or something like that, something that we imagine, and lived space, which is both real and imagined, and that's done so in the everyday lives of human beings. Um, Lefebvre's approach maps elegantly onto jazz space as well, which consists of a, a similar trialectic, perceived space as the encounter with sound in real time, conceived space as the mediated inscription and circulation of recorded sound, and lived space as the totality of systems and institutions that reproduce those sounds in society, in spaces such as jazz clubs. The trialectics of jazz space are reproduced through a system of isomorphic processes, not unlike those identified by John Meyer et al. in their article, World Society and the Nation State. As they argue, quote, many features of the contemporary nation state derive from worldwide models constructed and propagated through global, cultural, and associational processes. These con the conceived space of jazz clubs, the production, excuse me, the production values that shape jazz recordings, and educational curricula drawn from American jazz pedagogy are all isomorphic processes. These isomorphisms operate in jazz space in a manner that can also be described by Karen Norsetina's term global microstructures, 
that is, patterns of relatedness and coordination that are global in scope, but microsocial in character, and that assemble and link global domains. Global microstructures contribute to the strong sense of connection across the vast geographies that I've witnessed in these places. Stephen Fell described a similar experience in his 2012 book, Jazz Cosmopolitanism in Accra, noting of his first impressions of Accra, quote, never before in a life of much travel had I experienced such an immediate ease of attachment with place, people, scenes. My ease of, my ease of attachment in jazz space, then, is made possible by these global microstructures. I should add, however, that they're still deeply affected by worldwide asymmetries of economic development and other similar power dynamics. For example, almost every jazz musician in film that I know still considers New York to be the center from which all the newest, freshest sounds emanate, and local scenes elsewhere are still judged by the degree to which their musicians can emulate modern New York jazz sounds. Um, L.A.'s Kamasi Washington being someone who is kind of pushing against that tide a little bit. He's not the only one, but the dynamic still exists. Um, this is the loneliness in Santiago de Chile where I spent much of uh, last year. So having identified the people and space of this ethnographic work, I'd like to conclude with some thoughts about ethnographic practice. And this is where we get back to this idea of listening and global scale. If ethnography is the dialogue of sensibilities implicated in encountering a people and place, then it must be rooted in the practice of listening. In his 2013 book, Knowing Jazz, Ken Crowdy convincingly argues for an understanding of jazz today as a community built on listening. I would argue that this is also true of the people and places animated by musical practice of all sorts. As I hear it, listening is the medium through which to understand the powerful aesthetic affinities that magnetize jazz musicians and fans around the world. This affects the ways in which often remarkably similar modes of listening allow for meaningful, meaningfully resonant sociality in jazz space, even across geographical distance and stark cultural differences. As Deborah Wong argues in her book, Speak It Louder, Asian Americans Making Music, listening practices are a crucial interstice for commodity capitalism and subject for this is doubly true in jazz. Audiences are formed by the microsociality of their listening practices. In addition, jazz musicians are similarly constructed in the moment of improvised music making, which can include feedback from an audience. This is what musicians talk about when they describe it, the energy of a room, a quote that has arisen in several of the interviews. And so I hope that this report of my own practice of ethnography as listening, the dialogue of sensibilities implicated in encountering people in jazz space can inform how we work with ethnomusicological practice as a tool to engage, activate, and support submarine sociality at a global scale. Thank you. So that con concludes this part of the talk. Um, and I think, so the, the next thing I'd like to, to do is to present sort of what happened next. <laughs> and so imagine we're all uh, in Sheffield, the United Kingdom, and uh, you're all British ethnomusicologists and, uh, and some other folks who are here for the conference, and it's time for, for Q&A. So what ended up happening was uh, the, I got a question right away from a senior scholar in the British, the British, what is it, the British, some, I forget the name of the academic society, but it's the British Ethnomusicology academic society, and he's one of the, the senior scholars in that group. And he really challenged this idea of having a, of talking about these, these phenomena as globally interconnected. Essentially he said, okay, I can understand that there are some people that are circulating in these spaces, and you can talk about things circulating and being interconnected, but what about people who are really making an intentional effort to have kind of you know, local spaces, local scenes, and they're really, they're really defining their own relationship to jazz as something sort of locally grounded and rooted. And he gave the example of, of, uh, of a sort of an emerging scene in Australia around there being kind of an Australian jazz that's sort of in, in process. And, and my response was that 
that of course these kinds of things are happening and that these uh, global circulation is really only one part of the puzzle and that everything is also relating to cultural realities and, and dynamics on the ground and also kind of regionally, which is different than, tran than the sort of global scale transnationalism that I'm talking about. Um, and I also pointed out that the decision to sort of emphasize the local at the expense of the global is also a, a, a decision that is, uh, that is done in relation to that global thing that it's being positioned against, right? So, so being anti is still being in relation to the thing. And so having thought that I have addressed this question, I you know, thought, thought you know, we're, we're done. And, and his response was, uh, his, it's, all, it's almost uncomfortable to repeat his response, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, his response was, I suppose you can take that position as long as you don't mind being lynched in Australia. And I was just kind of taken aback by this, this comment um, and the sort of casualness with which, it was, with which it was delivered. And I think gave the impression that I didn't really know how to like, address the question. And so I said something in fact, like, excuse me. You know, and, and he just repeated himself. He's like, I said, mm. uh, and so uh, that kind of ended the conversation. And uh, you know, afterwards, we had a chance to. You know, he kind of came up to me afterwards, saw that I'd been flustered, and said, you know, sort of sorry for being on the spot. And, and I told him, like, you know, to be clear, it really it wasn't the, the content of your question, which you know has, is interesting to talk about. That was that was uh, upsetting to me. It was this, the casual use of, of this language, which has this. You know, violent history and, and all of these things, and his, his response was, "Oh well, it's fine. Yeah, you know, in the UK we don't really think about it that way." And that ended the conversation. And um, I have to say, I'm incredibly grateful to the uh, cohort of UCLA scholars of Black music who happened to also be at this conference. Um, Skylar Weldon from the musicology department, who writes about um, the Brazilian popular music in the '60s, and was giving a paper. Katie Staffelbein, who had been doing her dissertation research and uh, with traditional Ghanaian women musicians was there, and Deontay Harris, who's a PhD student doing his field work now with uh, uh, Black Britons uh, around the Notting Hill Carnival. So we had kind of our little uh, UCLA cohort there, and we had a great hang afterwards to kind of start processing this together. But I mean, it really brought out a different uh, side of this, uh, what, what, what's at stake for me in thinking through these issues of interconnection and global scale. Because I feel really strongly about this, um, that, that really believing, and the more that I dig into this, really understanding that it is these uh, signifiers of blackness and circulation that I'm encountering in these places. Of course, that's not always what, um, how people locally often think about it either, as was evidenced by this comment. Um, and so I, I've been, I'm in this space now. This happened. This this talk was on Saturday, so I've been kind of thinking through that as I've been, you know, I flew back to the states yesterday and uh, um, had the privilege of hanging out with Deontay and his uh, his uh, Caribbean cohort in London for a day, and um, that that's kind of where I'm at now. Is like having having brought this together and now um, really gotten a dose of. Uh, kind of what's at stake from, from the, the reception that it receives. And um, one thing that it, that it makes me uh, want to do to sort of as an addendum to this paper is to talk a little bit more about something I didn't have time for in the paper, which is um, actually telling some stories of the black people that I met in these spaces. Because although they were few and far between, the fact that I did meet at least one black person in each of these places is significant. And I was inspired by uh, the, uh, I finally watched Moonlight on the plane on the way home. And in the beginning, the, 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 one of the early characters, Juan, tells the, tells the kid, you know, we, we, there's black people all over the world. We're the first people on this planet. You, there's no, pla no place you can go where you won't find a black person. And I can confirm, having traveled to Nova Zagurska, Liberia, that this statement is true. Um, or at least provide some additional evidence for that. Because uh, so I'll start with that one because that was uh, a really uh, sort of uh, interesting connection, and that was uh, the 
his, his name is uh, C.Q. Plan, and he's a Cuban, uh, Cuban by birth, and his, mo his mother had been a successful, uh, she had led a successful Afro-Cuban dance review type uh, group that had toured for a long time in the, in the former Soviet Union, and about 10 years ago, sort of retired and handed the group over to him, and so he started, he started taking advantage of these same circuits that she had established to uh, tour with a group of, of uh, Afro-Cuban musicians to Russia and, and the, the republics that were part of the former Soviet Union. And about 10 years ago, at a gig in Novosibirsk, he uh, met a Russian woman who loved the music, and they fell in love, and he moved to Siberia. And so he'd been living there, doing his thing, making a living as a, as a, as a professional musician. Um, he's a big Stevie Wonder guy, so he's kind of has a, like a, you know, R&B, Latin rock kind of um, cover band, and um, has been doing that in, in those years for, for 10 years. And we met at a jam session of the annual Nova Sibirsk uh, Sib Jazz Fest, that's called the Siberian Jazz Festival, that happens at the State Philharmonic Society every year. And my visit coincided with that. Um, I, I, uh, he was he was performing with a group of uh, black British well a, a group of black British musicians were sort of hosting the jam session because they had they had headlined the concert and I thought that he was a part of that group because these were the only five black people I had seen in my entire time in Siberia and so I started talking to him in English and he didn't understand what I was saying so then I tried talking to him in Russian we we were able to kind of figure it out and then mm -hmm. then when I realized he spoke Spanish we continued speaking in Spanish because I'm a lot more comfortable in Spanish. But um, that was a that was my first kind of reminder that this isn't just about the circulation of blackness beyond black bodies. There are black people that are circulating in these spaces too. Although it's certainly true that that the the signifiers circulate with a lot more um, fluidity and ease of movement on this scale than, than black people do. Um, Can I just yeah. What is yeah. the signifiers? Did you explain? I mean, I, what I mean by that are, are ways that people understand are relating to jazz in particular as something that is black, you know, and that is relating to uh, the, at least the understanding of a lot of people that I work with, and as I explained, not everybody, um, thinking about this as black music and as, with, and as music of origin in the, in the experience of African American people, particularly in the United States, um, is a part of what animates the, the activity. And so, even though oftentimes the most of the people I I, were, I was working with were, you know, more sort of mestizo uh, Chilean or white, um, uh, the, there was an understanding among the majority of people I worked with that that we were that we were connect the what was connecting and animating what we were doing was a sense of connection to um, black music, black aesthetics. Um, of, you know, narratives about this music coming from um, from sort of black cultural experiences. That's what I mean by these uh, signifiers that are circulating. Yeah. Um, so in Chile, this is another place that, um, unlike the rest of, well, you can think about Chile as sort of the farthest away from the Black Atlantic um, geography uh, because of the way the place that it is, it was it was never and the, the geography and um, just the nature of the, the uh, economy of exploitation, I guess you could say, that was set up by the Spaniards. It was never a place that sort of um, that sort of plantation style, you know, slavery based economics was um, the most sensible thing. So relative to somewhere like Brazil or, or Argentina or Peru, there was very little, uh, relatively very little uh, afro diasporic presence there historically. And so most people in Chile have never met a black person or never like met someone who self-identifies that way. And although in the, over the last 10 years, there's been a little bit more of a kind of um, a sense of uh, awakening around trying to understand what some of the Afro-Chilean roots are, it's something that's very New and certainly not something that is as deeply embedded in the, the, their understanding of themselves as in somewhere like Brazil. 
um, or in a place like Argentina where it's really about a history of uh, genocide. And um, so how that manifested in Chile is that we're in this jazz club where I, I met, it may, it may have just been one, one person that I came across, but, but I just, it was such a memorable story I wanted to tell it. Um, which is a, is a, 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 a man named uh, Solomon Dorsey, who I'd actually met in Los Angeles. And this is part, part of what I'm talking about, these things that are circulating. Um, I met him in Los Angeles at a, at a jam session that a friend had put together, um, Matt from you know. Um And, you know, met one time, played some music, and enjoyed it, never saw him again. And uh, then I saw him walking to Polonius one, one night that I was there. Santiago. It turns out he's the musical director for and the bass player for Jose James, who's a very successful um, jazz vocalist, and what they were touring through Santiago. And he's kind of a, uh, an explorer on his own. So he, rather than flying down with the band the night before and flying back the next day to the next place on their tour, he booked himself an Airbnb for a week ahead of the tour in Santiago because he wanted to just sort of walk around and explore. And you know he barely spoke a word of Spanish, and it's this this you know large African American gentleman who uh, you know kind of relished all of the like you know head turns that he got walking down the street in Santiago, and um, you know made some friends while he was there. And we ended up spending about a, a day sort of walking around the city together, kind of showing him, showing him around and talking about his experience, uh, you know, on tour with Jose James and and what brought him into Thelonious, and he said, obviously, I mean, you see it, you see, and I'll, and I'll have a photo of the front of Thelonious, but there's a, you know, there's a big picture of Thelonious Monk's face on the, you know, above the door of the oh, it's like, of course, if you're, you know, 5,000 miles away from where he grew up, and there's a picture of Thelonious Monk, of course, you're going to walk in. So he had just been wandering around the neighborhood, so I walked in, listened to some music. Um, and so, you know, that, that example is, is, is another Illustrates in a, in a slightly different way how um, you know these spaces can can actually um, magnetize in a way that you know um, wouldn't be the case had it been just some other space and some other club that, that it was really about the the way that the club owner really you know is very intentional about his commitment to this music and its African American legacy that is what. Um, able to make that connection happen. So those are the, um, that's the, the, the extent of the presentation that I have for today, but I'd really love to spend the last 15 minutes or so um, addressing any questions that anybody has, and, uh, and if anyone has any, uh, any feedback or um, questions for me, places that I'm like ignorant about that I need to like get diving into is, is why I came here. So um, yeah, does anyone have Hi. Right, well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience with uh, this process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, like I said, we've met before. Um, I identify with uh, a lot of your work primarily because I've, you know, I performed here in LA in, in jazz for about 25 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you mentioned Kamasi. We went to school together, all that. Um, so, you know, but one of the things, like, what she, you know, what, what she asked her, about. Um, her question prompted like some thoughts, you know, because uh, like you explained, like you started pretty much with the blue whale, right? You had gone to Chile, but then you went to blue whale, mm -hmm. and so um, so I can understand um, expanding your research and, and making those connections just as, as your mm -hmm. life develops. Um, but thinking about like um, the connection to African American experiences mm -hmm. and um, and that, you know. There's, there's plenty written, and you know, if you go around and talk to jazz musicians, you can see, like, even here in America, in LA, certain clubs have more of a white audience, right? Totally. It's more accessible. Yeah. But in LA, we also have places that are a little bit more, or a lot more black, right? Like, Absolutely. you're probably aware of, like, the like world, world stage. stage. But yeah. the world stage is not the same as the old world stage, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just a whole different, Dynamic. First, it's not even in the same space. It's in, across the street. Mm -hmm. The people that run it, it's a whole another thing. But just as far as the African American experience, I just thinking about what's said among like 
like the jazz masters, you know, and, and thinking about when you go to a place like touring musicians do and being with the people, like learning words, having a meal with them, you know, um, sometimes dressing how they're dressed as well as part of it. Um, so I'm thinking about a lot of these musicians, um, you know, it's been in articles where they question, like, is jazz black? Is, is it still black? I mean, that's, that's been going on for decades. Um, I wonder, like, if they're partaking in the Amer African American experience, as far as like, did you did they admit? Please say I have read this, that, or I have. What is the actual connection? Because even here in L.A. and in America, a lot of those masters are dying, you know, and so um, we're not able to get a lot of this information. A lot of the connection is through the sound and videos, you know, and it's more. Uh, technical things that people try to emulate, but the actual soul, the whole information, the whole lineage, there's not really that connection. It's almost imagined. But Absolutely. when you press, yeah, you and I think there's a there's definitely a link between what can what can move this far and what can't, right? And so, um, you know, I can probably answer this best about the situation in Chile, which you know there are. Which you know the, the relationship to their sense of sense of this really dramatically changed in the 1990s. Both of them, they ended up you know shaded dictatorship, so that meant that there was just kind of a more open society and things were more uh, different. Things were more widely accessible, especially things from outside the country. Um, but also with the beginning of the internet, you know, and so there's a whole generation of younger Chilean musicians in particular who you know are able to um, to like you said, connect with the sound. It's really, I would say, the, the sounds, the, 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 the video images, and then also the kinds of narratives and stories that are, that are told through, you know, mostly, I would say, educational institutions. So there's a lot of um, kind of uh, both, both sort of K-12, but I would say more in the kind of college age demographic institutions that are set up that are trying to, or, you know, teach people how to play jazz. And so part of that involves, you know, kind of telling their received understanding of where the music comes from and what's it about and all that. All of that is very, like, I would think about it as like low bandwidth information. Like you said, it's not like really sitting there and, and, and apprenticing with a, with a master. And the ones who have been successful, I would say, at some point have had an opportunity to come to the United States and continue that work here. So for example, Melissa Aldana, um, or Ludwig Carraden, who's uh, in Palo Menares, they're both, they both have spent a lot of time in New York and sort of sought those people out of New York. Um, they're, by the way, they're playing on Monday night at Blue Whale, so there's a, another kind of dots connecting thing happening. Uh, so yeah, I think that that there's, there are definite differences there. Those differences are also enforced by, you know, in, in, on a smaller scale, by things like segregation in our own city, you know? And, and I think the, the dynamic that you described, the difference between, say, the baked potato, blue whale, and the world stage, you know, has a kind of, those, those, some of those differences are, are racialized differences, and I think those are, um, you know, a product of, of local dynamics. And so, thinking about blue whale, in that sense, I mean, the, um, you know, and I've talked to you know, a good chunk of musicians about this, that, that, you know, it's not a place that feels like it's kind of has a, like an Afrocentric spatiality to it, right, in any way. It's more coming from, um, you know, a lot of people describe it as having like a New York energy, you know, comparing it to clubs that have been in, in New York, like the Village Vanguard or places like that which, again, is a site where these things happen, I think is animated by these places. But unlike, say, the world stage, it's not like a conscious creation of an African-American community. You know, and Jun Lee, the owner, is a South Korean immigrant. Um, and so, of course, this has always been true for jazz clubs. That, and I think the word jazz, too, like the talking about jazz as black music is one thing. I also think it's important to, to recognize, and this is something I'm like grappling with in my dissertation, is that the word itself, 
Um, the first use of the word jazz in print was in 1912 in the Los Angeles Times, describing a baseball, minor league baseball pitcher's curveball. And so this was something that was circulating in white American vernacular um, as something that sort of signified pep and vigor and unpredictability. Um, and so the word itself then became applied to the music a few, a few years later, but the musicians themselves were calling it ragtime in New Orleans until at least 1916. So when I, <laughs> it, it gets really complicated to talk about because the word jazz is coming from a place of, you know, uh, where, where the naming of it is something that was a part of, you know, white controlled capitalist uh, popular music culture that was sort of starting in the early 20th century. And at the same time, what it's referencing is this, this lineage of, of black cultural production that um, they're, they're sort of inseparable from one another. And you had yeah. Robert Ferris Thompson? You familiar with Robert Ferris? Uh -huh. No, he discusses the origins of the, the word. Uh-huh. Yeah. Connecting with most of his discussions about Congo. Congo's word. Right. Okay. And yeah. Uh, and I think his, um, so that, that's a really great example of the, the entanglement of the word and the, the cultural legacy. Because I think when he did that research, that was before um, a lot of this other like uh, newspaper research had come up, come up where it, and that had to do with digitizing newspaper archives and things like that, so you could just do word searches. And when that started happening, they found all this other evidence of sort of where, how the music how the word came into circulation and when it, when it came into the music. And what he's describing is this moment where that word came to be used to describe this music that was already happening and exactly Congo Square in New Orleans and all of that, all of that was going on. So that, um, yeah, that's, that's all kind of mixed in together, yeah. Because sometimes people use words, that's why we have oral history. Exactly. It's not written. They may yeah. be using words for, yeah. you know, for, for decades or yeah. however long before it ever gets written down. Yeah. yeah, and it may be that you know that that word. This is this is where we're getting into you know speculation. But it, it it may be that 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 when that word came via those channels to start being described in music, the musicians who had been calling it ragtime were like, yeah, I like this word. Like it resonates with these other these other things, and and it can have some resonance with that. Certainly, a lot of, of, of uh, musicians that, that I've known and, and spoken to have no, it's a controversial thing. Some musicians really don't like the word for the reasons that I've talked about. Other people really identify with it. And I think that kind of uh, fluidity is, is a reflection of how entangled the, 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 the naming and the music and the history of practice that sometimes about that. Yeah. yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I had a quick question based upon this subtle nuance that we're talking about. And being in these different spaces, um, how much new innovation based upon like cultural innovation were you seeing mixed with, um, I guess, the, the fundamentals of jazz? That's a really good question. I felt like um, uh, in, in, I'll say that Blue Whale has absolutely kind of galvanized the, the created music community here in Los Angeles in a way that has been pretty remarkable to witness. So when I came here, it was the fall of 2011, I think the first time I went to the club was about around, I think, the two-year anniversary of it opening. And the difference between then and now in terms of just how much is going on around it is pretty impressive. And so to me, that speaks to the fact that, that, it's, that the community like really kind of took to it and things started happening there and it's kind of created this effect where there are a lot of a lot of really fresh, exciting things happening there. Um, and part part that's partially why I love going there, you know, because I just knew that um, that June also has a very kind of um, eclectic booking approach. Um, he's not like Seb from La La Land where he's like, it's going to be pure jazz and it's going to be great. Um, no, he, he was always very um, very interested in kind of things that were that were you know maybe musicians that had a jazz background but were also engaging with rock or hip hop or um, there was a, a lot of uh, there was kind of a weekly residency with the Afro Cuban group there for a long time so I feel like that was always a part of June's booking philosophy um, and and in Chile 
actually all three clubs, I would say, have a, a very uh, a very flexible approach to genre, which um, is part of what makes them successful, I think, um, and, and part of what affords that sort of ground or soil for, for creative things to, to start to emerge. In Thelonious, um, there's def it's definitely the place that you go if you have a jazz thing to do, because it's kind of the, the space for jazz in Chile. And so there's a lot of things that are really engaging with the tradition pretty straight ahead. And then there's also the musicians that have been doing that for a while that are starting to try other things. And that's also the space for them. So it, it sort of starts to grow out of that place. So, it, it becomes where they're able to kind of put their roots into understanding the, the, the music and the tradition and engage with it to the degree that they can, and then it grows out of that into new directions. And also hosts, the other really important thing about Polonius, um, and to a lesser extent Truva, is that there are also places that musicians that are traveling through go and perform. So, you know, Branford Marsalis played there when I was, when I was there. Um, Jerry Berganzi played there when I was there. Um, the, the Snarky Puppy played there when I was there. So that there were, whenever musicians were coming through town, or you would get a thing like like Solomon Dorsey just coming through, um, and you know maybe sitting in on a jam session or something like that. So th this is always um, this is another function that the clubs serve is, is uh, kind of being a place that can capture some of the energy of what's circulating. Um, but yeah, and you know. I, I also, I, I'm thinking about it kind of in hindsight, but the places that I wanted to go tended to be these kinds of places, you know? So it's, I, it's not like I, I really did a, you know, comprehensive ethnography of the Chilean jazz scene. You know, having mm -hmm. based at Thelonious meant that I was kind of getting a particular take on what jazz, how jazz was happening there. Um, and it was definitely more of this uh, um, kind of, fluid, open sensibility that really did embrace new things happening. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, uh, thinking more to the kind of avant-garde side of things too, you know, I played a, a set of um, auto Ornette Coleman music and sort of harmonically inspired original compositions there that, you know, the, the owner was way into it. So it wasn't, um, like I said, not very not boxed in idea of what jazz and I think um, part of what that got me, part of what that's led me to think about is that it's that it's really not that genre approach to the music doesn't serve the project, doesn't reflect very well the projects of these musicians or these club, like the club owners. Basically, the people that I'm working with aren't really into policing the genre or even really thinking about the music as a genre. The space, however, is really important. It's really important that there be a jazz space, that there be places that they can go to just be jazz nerds, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's, what, that's what I've been finding. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, one thing it, it, I thought about was, was asking me a question that you said, you know, the idea of uh, engaging with, uh, with with the tradition in a in a very, I guess, uh, uh, personal, you know, almost uh, like from an apprentice, uh, you know, relationship is uh, something that you know we we don't even get much of. It seems anymore. A lot of musicians that I have you know, just learned via recording and whatnot. It kind of is akin to like um, learning English um, on the internet. If you become fluent, does it really matter how you learned it? You, sure, you you, you you miss these you miss these these relationships, which is something that you know, of course as an honor we uh, we would we would miss. But the reality is they're now fluent in this particular language, right? And so I I wonder um, post UK conference. Um, how much do you feel that you have to respond or address these ideas now of, like, say, say local um, local responses to jazz or um, what it, what are becoming or seen as um, or idealized as, like, this indigenous jazz, well, identifying with it somehow, um, but also um, the the authority then that's given to recordings and how one has engaged and learned their craft and 
does that affect your your research and are you, do you think of addressing that? And then also, um, have you thought about expat bars around the world? And are there is there research that you might be able to lead something from? Is it, and have you thought about that at all? Yeah, the expat thing. Um, I'm not familiar with any literature anymore, but it's definitely a part of the dynamic of what's going on in um, both Chile and Truba is if, like I was they're, 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 they're very cosmopolitan spaces. It was easy to find um, folks from all over the place at these at these places, and and these are both in both in relatively not particularly cosmopolitan places, you know. So. Um, that, that, that is definitely another another dynamic that's being magnetized is, is this idea of it sort of being something that resonates with people who might be from somewhere else. Um, uh, the the issue of sort of indigenizing or localizing practices and whatnot, um, I think it's related to the the answer I gave about genre and that that I feel like it's just the folks who are most invested in that, for what, for whatever reason or not, the people that have been like wanting to do work in particular spaces where I am, and also talk to me about it. Um, however, there are definitely it's it's I think what it, what I've learned from what I've been thinking about these last few days are thinking about the exceptions to that, and, and maybe looking a little bit more closely at the ways in which. Um, there are, for, I'm thinking about like the Mapocho Orchestra, which is like a big band that's like trying, that's like um, sort of positioning themselves as like trying to be about kind of, um, you know, indigenous rights in Chile. They're playing the protests and stuff like that. And like they'll play a gig at, at the Lodges every once in a while. And a lot of the musicians, of course, are like regulars in those scenes. So I think there are ways. Um, that I need to that I need to be clear about that, so that I'm not so that I'm not sort of falling into a like a dichotomy where it's like there's there's the kind of jazz that I study, and then there's this other stuff. Like in order to really show that this is that these are things that are are sort of globally interconnected. Yeah. Is there a part of your question that I missed? Um, recording authority, maybe. Right, recordings. Yeah. So um, one thing that I that I do feel, in particularly in Chile. I, I haven't done enough interviews in Russia, know if this is true there, but definitely in Chile, the recordings are definitely part of the situation. The, the other piece, though, is that the, that the lineage that they're a part of is the local one. So for example, Melissa Aldana, her grandfather was the, the sort of star saxophonist in Chile's most popular dance band in the 1930s, or guest star Juan Bali. So there's, um, in fact, I saw a good number of the, the most successful young Chilean musicians come from families of dance band musicians. So there's a there's a local history of popular music production that they're that they're sort of inheriting and they're putting into conversation with that. So so and her father um, was a finalist for Polonia's Monk competition in like 1989 or something, the year that Joshua Redman won. Um, he was one of the semifinalists. So there's, you know, these these musicians are are, um, you know, that there are li local lineages that that these are being put into conversation with. And this is something I didn't talk about in this talk, but you know, it's definitely something I'm addressing in my dissertation. There's long histories of engagement with these signifiers locally, transnationally, that are part of what generate and inform how the music is made on a local level. So you know, the fact is, there's been jazz happening. In Chile for a hundred years, you know, so there's a local history of, of meetings and practices around that that um, are a piece of the puzzle, for sure. Yeah, and I think when you know we in thinking about jazz as a, as black music, I think we also have to think about it as a, a music of you know capitalist modernity. It's both of those things at the same time, and um, you know the ways in which it was able to circulate in somewhere like Chile in the early 1920s has more to do with the capitalist modernity side than, than the black music side, but those two things again aren't really ever not connected to one another. Yeah. Great, well, thank you so much for being here.